So maybe you're saying to yourself, well, I'm, you know, I'm not a leader. The Church of Christ does not run like a Fortune 500 compass. God is the ultimate authority. And all authority, quite honestly, is given or delegated from Him. The book of Proverbs is the place to learn and to hone our ability to lead our families, churches, businesses, and communities. Leadership principles are often given uh, by the writers of Proverbs in terms which they are familiar with in ancient society. That is, kings, princes, people of the court, military leaders, fathers, and so forth. So in other words, maybe you saw as I read that about half of that chapter, nowhere was the word leader used or leadership. But you did see the words king and the ideas that surround a, uh, the royal court. Uh, in ancient society, you, you, we have to remember that the division between the poor and the rich was a chasm. You had the royalty and those that serve very closely to royalty, and those might be educated and have resources and responsibilities, and then you might have a, a few under them uh, that were stewards of high level or so forth that might have a, a level of education and oversight. But once you get below that, other than the father and mother or the patriarch of the family, you wouldn't have what we would typically think of today as leaders. You know. uh, but you can see in the Old Testament where, as we said Sunday, um, the clans of Israel or the tribes of Israel were broken down into family clans and then into individual families. So you had leaders of the tribe, then leaders of the clans, and then individual fathers who were leaders of their own personal group of families. So you, you do get a little bit of that kind of leadership, but not like we hear today where we have, you know, every man ministry and all kinds of programs and things in churches where, where uh, lay people lead whole programs and uh, manage budgets and handle uh, volunteers or even paid staff and things like that. Uh, that was a thing that did not really happen as much in the ancient society. But having said that, what were these people at the top of society, we might say? They were leaders. They were kings, princes, lords, owner, landowners, uh, people that had some level, you know, of either military or legal, possibly educators and, and such. They, they led in one way or another to some extent. So the idea of how to lead as in a biblical way is clearly here. Uh, but, you know, we're not kings and queens and, and princes and all that kind of stuff. But we do learn from that, from this passage, or from many of these passages, how people in authority ought to behave, how they ought to lead like God would have them lead. That's what we're really saying. Now, does it apply to the royal court? Does it apply to kings and queens? Does it apply to presidents and governors and mayors and, and placeholders in, within our society? Absolutely. Absolutely. It applies to them first and then to uh, anyone else who holds authority other, other, over other people in any capacity secondly. All right? I'm just applying the, the principles maybe more to the secondary because we're not in a royal court. So maybe you're saying to yourself, well, I'm, you know, I'm not a leader. Well, there's a truth in that not everybody's called to lead on a great scale. There does typically be uh, areas where you have to lead, whether it be in your own home or your own children or grandchildren, when you teach Sunday school or something. You are in some capacity, some level, providing that ministry of leadership. 
the first thing we see here is that biblical leadership is given by God according to his plan. So it's given by God. It's a gift. I would say it this way. It's a gift from God. Now here what I mean is the place of authority. Let me, let me just say it. The, the place of authority, the... Um, of authority, or we might even say the position um, the position is a gift from God. This is the way the Bible, in many ways, deals with our arrogance, our pride, our ambition. God is the ultimate authority, and all authority quite honestly, is given or delegated from him. Leading is not for everyone uh, at every level, especially within the covenant community. Now, of course, we're in Proverbs, so we're primarily looking at the nation of Israel. But these are often, they're timeless uh, Proverbs. They're timeless truths or principles that can inform us even in the church today or in our own lives today. So yes, this applied to the covenant community of Israel, but in many ways it also applies to the covenant community of the church. An example, we read some here in, in Proverbs 16. We'll come back to that. But right now, Proverbs chapter 19, if you'll turn over there, verses 1 through 10, uh, well, really, it's, uh, I want you to look at verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, and then down at verse 10. Better is a poor person who walks in his integrity than one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. Remember, the fool is one who knows the truths of God, the commandments of God, but chooses not to follow them. Okay, So the Bible's not calling them names. It's, it's saying, this is foolish. God has given you the Ten Commandments. God Almighty has given you the way, and you choose your own way. That's foolish. So better is a poor person who walks in his integrity than one who is crooked in speech and is a fool. Desire without knowledge is not good, and whoever makes haste with his feet misses his way. When a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. Wealth belong, brings many new friends, but a poor man is deserted by his friends. And then verse 10. It is not fitting for a fool to live in luxury, much less for a slave to rule over princes. So what we're seeing, especially verse 10, we see this, it's an axiom. Remember, it's not always true in every situation. It's a general truth that's true in most situation, situations. Much less, he says, verse 10, second part, much less for a slave to rule over, a prin over princes. Can anybody think of a slave in the Bible who wound up ruling over princes, and it was God's will. Joseph, exactly. So does that mean that this verse is wrong? No, it doesn't. It means that as a general rule, a slave is not going to have the education, the know-how, the, the clout, the connections, all of the things that it takes to rule over the court. That's just not going to be a normal situation for a slave to have that. But it does happen in very rare circumstances, okay? Now, I'm not really pointing out the exceptions so much as I want us to understand what, what the writer is saying. Biblical leadership is, is a place given by God. So the truth is, and we see this in the New Testament, where Paul says, that the slaves were not really, they're not commanded in, as they get saved to rise up against their, their masters. They're told to obey their masters and to serve Christ. Then the masters are told, you treat your, your servants and slaves rightly knowing that you have a master in heaven. 
Now, what, what are we saying here? We're, in other words, the Bible is saying that God gives position, authority, place, leadership. So the Bible doesn't teach this same idea that we have in our culture of, you know, the dog eat dog, that you have to, to, you know, fight other people to climb your way to the top. In some ways, that kind of attitude has invaded the church of Christ. It's even invaded in the ministry, and it is ungodly. Uh, a good friend of mine told me one time when we were discussing a fellow pastor friend, uh, and he's a friend, but his background was in a, um, a Fortune 500 company, and uh, we were discussing how this guy was so competitive and how that was in, impacting the church and his relationship in the ministry, that he was so driven and, and trying to beat all the other pastors. The, the, my brother, who I love in the Lord and has lots of wisdom, said, well, that's his background. He was trained in uh, this Fortune 500 company to be a go-getter like that. I said, doesn't matter. It's sin. The church of Christ does not run like a Fortune 500 company. To come in here uh, or any congregation and claw your way over other pastors to get their position or their, uh, their role among the congregation is pride, it's ambition, it's lust, it's wrong. It's the, the right thing is for us to realize that it's God who puts people in position. David realized that, didn't he, in the Old Testament. David was anointed the new king, but David did not assume kingship until God had rem himself had removed Saul. On two occasions, so David could have taken Saul's life, and on both occasions, David refused. He said, I will not put my hand to the Lord's anointed. And so... That's true of anything. How many of us have had uh, a child in our home start challenging our authority when they move into those teenage years? But I can remember saying, listen, God made me the father, and he made your mother the mother. And God told us to lead our family. Someday you'll be a father, and you'll be a husband or a mother and a wife. And you will be able to lead your home. And you will be accountable to God for how you do that. Meanwhile, you're under my authority and you're going to have to do what I say. You see, God establishes authority. And we see this, uh, this principle going on in, in these passages. I would say verses 1 through 4 uh, do not say it expressly, but in many ways they, bring some, they shed some light on a, the way a leader should see uh, his or her role. Desire without knowledge is not good. Some people want raw authority. When the Bible says that those who lead ought to have godly wisdom. When it comes to the ministry, uh, I've heard older pastors say it, and I believe they're definitely correct. A call to preach is a call to prepare. There is no man out there who just all of a sudden has the wisdom and the understanding of God's Word and just to get up and start telling everybody how to live or how to understand the Bible and all that's ridiculous. It takes study. It takes walking with the Lord. It takes prayer and fasting. It takes God putting you through the ringer and, some day, you know, and teaching you some of these things. And, and it takes years of experience and making mistakes and learning from them. It takes all those things, but mainly the Word of God. That you, you pour the Word into your life so that the Word of God begins to shape and mold you. This is why John, uh, Paul says, do not lay your hands in the sense of ordination on any man too quickly, lest he be lifted up with the temptations of the devil. 
Now, that doesn't mean a young man can't be in the ministry. What it means is don't be too quick to put him in the ministry. You may just have harmed him by making him uh, in a precarious situation. So there's lots of wisdom that informs verse 10 that can come out of verses 1 through 4. In each of these Proverbs, we see the principle illustrated through everyday scenarios that being at the top, having the fanfare, being the top dog, as it were, and having the cash is not healthy or wise for anyone. These Proverbs help us understand that some do not know how to use influence for the glory of God and the good of others, and that this is okay. A slave or a servant, or we might say today, thank God we don't have slaves in the United States, although they are in other countries. All we hear about is America, but there are countries that still have slavery. The news media is not telling you that. They have a political agenda here on American soil that they're using. But thankfully, we don't have slavery here, but we do have uh, different strata in our, in our society, don't we? You know, we have the very poor. We have those that maybe have not had opportunities to have education or, or, or whatever. Then we have different levels of, you know, the middle class where we, you know, we're the low middle, the middle, the upper middle, and, and so forth. And we've seen, um, by the way, that uh, the gap over the COVID crisis, the gap between the super rich and the middle class have done this. If you don't believe me, go do a little bit of research. The billionaires got richer and richer, and we all got poorer and poorer. Small businesses were shut down, and the mega businesses profited in a major way. But that's just, that's not my notes. I just threw that out there. That, but we do have different strata in our society, don't we? And the truth is, we're not all cut out to be the president of the United States or the vice president. I can tell you right now, I'm not cut out for it. Number one, I wouldn't want it. But I couldn't do it if I had to. It's just not, I, I'm not gifted in that way. There are some who are. And thank God for that. But we need to realize, have a healthy opinion, a healthy understanding. Where has God placed me? And bloom, as the saying goes, where you're planted. Instead of just being unhappy and lustful or, or you know, ambitious for something else that God himself has not given us. It is simply um, some we need to just accept that and be okay with it. That, it's, that that's not our role. As I told you one other time, uh, one young man told me uh, that he didn't want to be in a certain ministry because he would never, in that ministry, he would never be uh, a Billy Graham or an Elijah or a Moses. And uh, I said, well, I got news for you. I'm not trying to be a smarty here, but almost none of us are going to be a Billy Graham, a Moses, or Elijah. That's why they are who they were. Or, you know, I mean, you, you're your vision of who you are and your own gifts need to be tempered with humility and understanding. And it's God who makes an Elijah. It's God who makes an Elisha. It's God who chose Moses. It wasn't Moses saying, I want to be uh, the prophet of Israel. That's, that, that, that's not how this happens. And, and for us to desire that, is probably uh, an, in, an indication that we're not on the right track. What we see in this passage is it's simply not God's will for everyone or every person to lead. Who will lead uh, is determined by God. Who will teach the church, especially, is, is a gift by God. The teaching doesn't set well with the modern pop philosophy, which simply teaches uh, that... Today, everybody should aspire to the highest uh, levels of society. We hear nonsense like you can do anything you want to do. 
I wish we'd stop telling young people that. It's a lie. It's a, it's a, it's a recipe for discouragement. It's a recipe for uh, depression. We can't do anything we want to do. We can't be anything we want to be. Uh, we, we can seize opportunities that are brought our way. We can pray. We can make the best of what we're given. Some people are not given as many opportunities as others. Some are born into uh, wealth. Others are born into poverty. Now, that isn't necessary. We've seen people who were born into wealth and training and education squander every bit of it just to become a, a poor person. And we've seen others born with almost no education, no money, no opportunity, but they seized what every, every little bit uh, opportunity they could. They made the best they could with their situation, and by the end of their life, they had become whatever, you know, what you and I would say, successful. Um, and you can do that in America. There's a lot of places in the world. Here again, this is why this is such a lie. There are places in the world where if you're born, there's almost a caste system. There are places where there is a caste system. If you're born as a servant or the lower caste, you're not climbing the ladder. That's not even allowed. That was the way England was when America was founded. You couldn't climb the ladder. It was set. America was revolutionary uh, in a good way in that this was a nation that if you were willing to work hard and train yourself and have some humility, there's a good chance that by the end of your life, you will have done all right. And you might even be at the top or whatever. That's not true around the world. The New Testament, James, in the New Testament, James tells us as much as this in chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, Not many of you shall become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. So James is saying it's not everybody's calling to teach the church. I've had brand new Christians. I mean, they living for Satan, get saved, get baptized, and suddenly, you know, well, I need, I feel like I'm, I'm called to teach. Excuse me? There's a little bit of setting, sitting and learning that needs to happen. Not every, and this is primarily, as we looked at in the book of James, when we went through that, this is primarily referring to the pastors and elders in the church, which are teachers. Not everybody's called to be a preacher. Not everybody's called to be an elder. Who would learn? If everybody's a teacher, then who's going to learn? You know, and, and the pastors are there, we find out in Ephesians chapter 4, for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. It's not that they are um, up here. No, their gift is to equip the church. They're equippers. They're serv so leadership in the Bible comes with a heavy dose of servanthood, not lording it over God's heritage. James warns us that not everyone is called or cut out to be leader or a teacher in the local church. For some, the wisest thing they can do is to humbly accept that they are not called or equipped to teach and lead within the church. I, said, I told you before how that we were at, the, the, in my former church, all of us pastors, we had a, a uh, like staff meeting at the North American Mission Board there in, Atlanta, in uh, uh, Alpharetta. Georgia. And one of the leaders there was walking us around and showing us some of the stuff that they had done on the facility and, and where we could meet and so forth. And while that was happening, he somehow got off on the subject of the dropout rate in, pa in pastoral and missionary or seminary students who were supposedly going into ministry. And he was quoting, and I don't remember the statistics, but supposedly there was a large amount of guys that have gone through seminary and then they go into the pastorate and they're only there for a year or two and then they just quit completely. They go out of the ministry, they go get secular jobs, and they're done. And he said, you know, we've got to change that. I, I said, really? Why do we need to change that? We're going around pressuring young people as Christian leaders oftentimes to go into the ministry, become missionaries and all that, 
when God hasn't called all of them to do that. And so many of them decide that they're going to do this and they go off to seminary and they, do, and, the, and they do all this and then they get into the ministry and then realize, oh, this is not for me. I don't want to be here. That's a good thing. They just found out God's will for their life. I'll never forget one of the, the elders uh, in the church I served there in, in Illinois. He had, his, the former pastor had told him, he goes, he's a very big student of the scriptures, a diligent, godly young man leading his family. And the pastor told him, well, you're called into the ministry. You're, 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 you're exceptional. I mean, he could carry on conversations with seminary trained pastors. That's just, this is the way he worked. But he, his job was a, was a carpenter. Built houses and stuff. And... Um, so his pastor just kept telling him, man, you need to go in the ministry. You need to go to seminary. You're, you're called into the ministry. So he packed up his family, moved off to seminary, spent a year in seminary. And at the end of the year, he said, I'm a carpenter. And so he went home and continued his carpentry business. He was a deacon and an elder in the church, taught Sunday school and a real blessing to the current pastor and to myself. You see, God doesn't call everybody to be the pastor. There's tons of leadership opportunities everywhere else. And I'm only really using that as an example to see that God calls us to be wherever we are. We don't have to go fight over it. And if, you know, God calls us to lead and God calls us to serve. And sometimes we serve and sometimes we lead. And that's what God gives us. In Ephesians, we're given this, uh, this same idea. He says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and pastor teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine but, or, or human cunning or by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped Every, when uh, each person is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So we see that the offices in the church are given by God. Why? Not to be out front, not to be the center of attention, not to be any, the top dog or any of that kind of stuff. To build up Christ's church. In the church, leadership means shepherding, serving. It means caring for people. It means teaching the church family. It doesn't mean what the world you know, wants it to mean. Calvin once said, when God desires to judge a nation, he gives them evil leaders. What does that say about the church as well? The Apostle Paul and Proverbs tells us that biblical leaders are gifted from Christ to his church. Remember what Paul said in Ephesians. He says, he that has descended, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, came from heaven, has also ascended back into heaven and gave gifts to his church. And what were the gifts? Apostles and prophets. Those were the New Testament apostles and the New Testament prophets which those positions no longer exist, evangelists, which I would personally consider to be missionaries, and the pastor-teacher. So missionary and pastor-teacher are that office is a gift from Christ to the church, his church, his church. To, and we go on in Ephesians 4 to build up the body to the full maturity to the unity in Christ that we not be 
wavered around with every wind of doctrine and schemes of men. So you see, spiritual authority is a gift from God. Now, when it's a gift from God, you might say, well, well, does that mean that anybody that is called to teach or to minister or to be an elder or a deacon or something like that within the congregation, does that mean that, you know, they should get a big head because they've been called? No. You know why? God could have called anybody. God didn't call them because they're, they are smart or strong or good-looking or rich or any of those things. God called according to his sovereign, wise counsel. And the truth is, that's God's business, not ours. We can't take any gloating or pride in this because we didn't, we didn't do it. God did it. This is a guard, if it's understood properly, this is a guard against pride, against uh, lustful ambition in uh, spiritual leadership. And, of course, what applies to spiritual leadership often applies to any other form of leadership. Let's pray. Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to our latest video. Go ahead and click that little thumb so you can like that video, as well as on the bottom right hand corner, click that little bell to subscribe and receive notifications. Thank you again so much for tuning in, supporting our video ministry here at Cognitive Church.